first Sunday in July. And I hope that everyone had a wonderful 4th of July yesterday. Like it seems everything in the world today, it was different. There were no big parades and there were no big firework shows. My granddaughter Madeline was very disappointed. Yesterday, the 4th of July is Madeline's birthday. She turned seven. And she has always considered that the parades and the fireworks was to celebrate her birthday. But we had a party and we had some sparklers and we had a good time and she had a good time and that's the only thing that's important. So as we always say, keep us informed, let us know what's going on with you. We want to stay connected. So our lesson today, we're still in the book of the prophets. And last week, we looked at the prophet Hosea and God's unusual call to Hosea when he commanded him to marry a prostitute and to have children, to demonstrate to the people that they had committed great prostitution by deserting the Lord and his commandments. Today, we're going to look at what some have called one of the greatest men in the Old Testament. We're going to look at Jeremiah. Last week we talked about how simple the call was that God made to Hosea. Uh, the text tells us that God simply spoke to Hosea. The call to Jeremiah was a little different. In the first chapter that we learned that Jeremiah was the son of a gentleman by the name of Hilkiah. And he was a priest, a member of the tribe of Levi. And Jeremiah was born and lived in a little town called Anathoth, which is about three miles from Jerusalem. And this was a town that was set aside for the priestly tribe of Levi. That's where they lived. So no doubt Jeremiah was raised in a priestly and a very devout home. And about the age of 18, Jeremiah felt the call to follow the vocation of a prophet. But unlike Hosea, Jeremiah resisted. He said, Lord, I can't be your prophet. I'm just a young man. I'm a youth. But God told him, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. And then it says that God reached out his hands and with his fingers touched the lips of Jeremiah and told him, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth, and I have set you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and pull down, to destroy and throw away, and to build and to plant. God's instructions to Jeremiah reflect what we talked about last week. The job of a prophet was to deliver God's message to his people. And very often it was a message that they did not want to hear. Because of their sinfulness, and most of the time it was because of the worship of idols, God's wrath and punishment was coming. But there was always a message of hope. Just like God told Hosea, or told Jeremiah, not just to root out and pull down, but to build and to plant. And today we're going to kind of look at both of those. Jeremiah's prophecy took place in the southern kingdom of Judah, and the people there were not doing a very good job of following the commands of the Lord and, and the laws that they had been given. Why do you think that is? Was it all their fault? Did the people just decide on their own that, hey, we're not going to be following these commands and these laws anymore? We're not going to worship the God of our ancestors anymore? Let's look at what Jeremiah had to say about that. Our lesson today is entitled Promise Restoration. And the purpose statement reads to understand how God restores God's people. And our scripture is in the book of Jeremiah in the 23rd chapter, starting with verse 1. 
Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel, against the shepherds who feed my people, you have scattered my flock, driven them away, and not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for the evil of your doings, says the Lord. But I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them back to their foals, and they shall be fruitful and increase. I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them. They shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. Behold, the day is coming that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign, reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he shall be called, the Lord, our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the day is coming, says the Lord, that they shall no longer say, As the Lord lives, he brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt. But, as the Lord lives, he brought up and led the descendants of the house of Israel from the north country and from all the countries where I have driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. So Jeremiah says, Watch out. You shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. Other translations like the one I read today says, Woe be unto you. So who was Jeremiah talking to? The word shepherd is commonly used throughout the Bible. Jesus himself called himself the good shepherd. In the Old Testament, it usually referred to the kings, the prophets, and the priests. Today, we use it to refer to pastors and religious leaders. The shepherds were and are the ones charged with the responsibility of guarding and guiding the sheep to make sure they followed the right path, to keep them safe from the predators, and to lead them to the green pastures and the still waters. Jeremiah was talking to the leaders of his day both religious and political, and they had failed in their jobs. The unity of the community of faith was being destroyed, not only from without, but also from within. God said to Jeremiah that they had scattered and destroyed his flock, his people. By their actions, they were leading the people away from God. They were allowing the laws and the commandments of God to be disobeyed. In a lot of places, they were even promoting this by their own actions. Just as God had set apart the people of Israel to be his chosen people, to be an example to the world so that the entire world could come to see and come to know God, by the way they interacted with each other and by the way that they acted with those people that lived around them, he had also set apart the kings and the leaders to be different. They were the ones who should teach the commands and the laws of God. Not only teach, but they were the ones who would show by example and follow those laws. I remember many, many years ago taking a course, many, many years ago, taking a course on effective management. And the professor in that course spent a lot of time talking about the difference between a manager and a leader. The ultimate goal of a manager is to get the job done. The methods that he or she use are of secondary concern. <coughs> The end results are what matter. Uh, There's no concern of a manager really for the people that they are over. A leader, on the other hand, main goal is to create an environment where people want 
to get the job done. Where people want to be successful, not only for themselves, but for the people around them. Which one do you think has the more lasting results? Everything rises and falls on leadership. And the leaders that Jeremiah was addressing were just not doing their job. They were allowing the people to be led astray. Allowing them, if you will, to be conformed to the world in which they were living instead of following the commands of God. I like the way one of the lesson writers referred to uh, the job of these leaders. Uh, he said it might be wrong to call them shepherds. What they really were were sheepdogs. I remember years, uh, for a lot of years, Karen and I every year attended the Highland Games in a little town called Red Springs, North Carolina. And they were a ton of fun. Uh, watching the caber toss, have you ever seen guys with telephone poles and they pick them up and throw them? Uh, of course, watching the Highland dancing and listening to the bagpipe bands. But always the most intriguing part for me was the cheap dog demonstrations. You had these cute little border collies and they could herd this huge flock of sheep from a far distance and bring them in to a little bitty pen. And if one of them got off the path, if one of them started going the wrong way, one of those little border collies would break off and go get them and gently bring them back to the fold. It was a shepherd that determined the path that they were to follow. And we all know who the good shepherd is. The sheep dogs made sure that they kept moving forward and in the right direction. And if one strayed off, they went and got them and gently brought them back to the flock. But God said to them through Jeremiah, you have not cared for my sheep, but I'm going to take care of you. Behold, I will attend to you for the evil of your doing. And as we said, even though the prophets always had a message of the coming wrath of God for their sinfulness, there was also always the message of hope. And we have that right here. It seems one minute Jeremiah was talking about the judgment of God on the leaders of the day, and the next minute God was proclaiming the mercy for his people. He said, I will gather the remnant of my flock bring them back together, and they will be fruitful and multiply. The idea of a remnant is throughout the Old Testament. Almost all of the prophets talked about the remnant. Even in the book of Genesis, when uh, Joseph was talking to his brothers who had come to Egypt, and he told them that God had sent him to Egypt to preserve a remnant through the drought that was destroying the land. So who are they? They're the ones that even though turmoil was happening all around them, even when the leaders of the day seemed to be going in totally opposite directions, even when the social morals of the day say, hey, this is all right, this is the way the world's going, and if we're going to be part of the world, then we've got to join in with them. These are the people who throughout this stay faithful to God. God says that the day is coming when I shall gather them together, and I will give them shepherds who will feed them, and they will fear no more, and they will not be lacking for anything. And a new king will be raised up, a branch of David, and he will execute the judgment and the righteousness throughout the earth. And we all know who he was talking about. So let's think about this. Who's the remnant today? I think it's us. Those of us that even though the world says this is the thing to do and even though people around us engage in all sorts of different things, it is us who Bible study and through prayer 
and through fellowship with believers around us, continue to follow the laws and the commands of God. The church today, I think, is the remnant, even though our numbers seem to continue to dwindle. Then who are the shepherds among us? Who are the leaders? I think we have some very good ones. I think we can point to Pastor Karen and, and the leadership she has shown us as we go, continue to go through this pandemic and this very troubled time. And of course, there's some out there who aren't doing the job that they really should be doing, and that will be a lesson maybe for another day. But I think in a way, we're all the leaders. Now, I know some of you are out there saying, Tom, what are you talking about? I'm not a preacher. I'm not a public speaker. I don't have the knowledge to lead anyone. I don't think people really care what you know or how much you know until they know how much you care. And God calls his people to be caring people. When I look around our church today, I see many great leaders. A lot of them have never stood behind a pulpit. Many have never taught a Sunday school class. And probably a whole lot of them have never even chaired a committee. But their actions speak of their leadership. A telephone call, a thank you card, a text message or an email, a gentle word, or a simple pat on the back. When one of us find ourselves in a dark place, or maybe we ourselves have wandered off the path, these are the leaders through their actions that bring us back, help us to renew our faith, and keep us in the fold. It's a responsibility I think we all have. How do you think we're doing? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your unending love. Father, we thank you for the leaders that you have provided for us. We thank you for their love and their commitment. And we ask that you continue to guide them, to give them strength and to give them courage to proclaim your word. And Father, we thank you for the free gift and the promise of restoration. That you are always there, always waiting, even though we might wander off the path, do the things you would not have us to do, you are always there to welcome us back into the flock. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, thank you as always. Be safe. Be well, and we'll do this again next week.